You're about to watch an incredible presentation from our global online Power BI conference. Not only will you see some powerful reports and dashboards, but also the journey behind how they were built. We are a group of independent Power BI consultants, all with the mission of helping business users leverage Power BI to solve their data challenges and run their business more efficiently. If you need help, contact us at learnpowerbi.com. And if you would like to become a Power BI consultant and create your life of freedom, then check out our program at learnpowerbi.com slash pro. Enjoy this presentation and power on. First off, thank you for inviting me to, to speak today. I thought it was only fitting that I that I repped the the free t-shirt I won during last last year's conference um, for participation. So stay involved, guys. You might get a cool Power BI Pro t-shirt out of it. Um, uh, so you know, I found this conference uh, to be incredibly inspiring last year. Uh, like I said, I joined as an attendee my first time last year, uh, and I really hope that you guys all, are all finding the same. I know we have a ton of incredible presenters, so. I'll do my best to, to maintain pace with all of them um, that have preceded me and those who are after me. Um, but I'm really excited to be talking about my, my ongoing journey here to uh, uh, in helping emerging alcohol brands better understand their businesses, make better strategic decisions, allowing them to spend time uh, working on their business and not just caught up in the day-to-day really by driving them towards more accurate and efficient access to their data. Um, so I'd like to kind of start everything off by describing some of the early, early challenges that we fed, that we, uh, that we met as we were going. So I'm going to describe this as the data hangover, uh, self-proclaimed, just something I threw in here because I thought it'd be fun and tie, tie into our, our overall topic. Um, they have lots of data accessible to them. Um, in fact, in some cases, too much data. Uh, no easy way to put it all together. Uh, like alcohol, um, you know, too much consumed without guide rails or responsibility can lead to headaches, um, or in our case, a hangover. Uh, so we have multiple different systems uh, that we're using here. Uh, they had Nielsen for retail sales information, uh, VIP for distribution data, uh, and then, as well as a bunch of internal forecasting, uh, like um, mostly based out of Excel. Uh, the, you know, the reporting that is available to them is really restrictive. Uh, they're charged by the number of reports that they run. Uh, the reports have limits on the columns and the rows. Uh, it could just be very prohibitive. Um, outside of that, once you did actually pull the information down, there's a single person that's responsible for putting this all together. Um, so they're pulling it, they're curating it. I mean, the guy was really, really good um, at doing Excel, but he's still doing this every time, um, you know, which led to inconsistencies with reports. Uh, so, you know, you might see certain things come up one and you actually forget to tick that box when you run the report next time. Um, and so as a result of this, there are a lot of different run, different ways to run the reports and just hours of manipulation it took to put them together. Um, so is there anybody here, can you relate to any of those, uh, any of those challenges? You know, they're fairly common in the, uh, in most of the, pretty much every industry. Um, and surprisingly enough, even in large organizations, it's still prevalent to be having all these different things. So you may be asking yourself, okay, there's problems, we get it, we all had it. Was it really that bad? Um, so this is just, this is a real example. I've, I've modified all the data, so it's not there. But this is a single report that was run. Um, I've got a couple different spreadsheets, but this is something that their Excel guru was responsible for putting together on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. Um, and you know, he'd just be losing hours and hours just putting the reports together. And then let's not even think about the change request that comes in uh, or the common, hey, this is really good, but I, I'd like to include this other factor. Uh, you know, you, you have static data like this, you got to go back to the drawing boards and do it again. Um, so where were we able to take it? We started off with these Excel spreadsheets, one guy curating everything, no model. Could be great. Excel is a wonderful tool. 
But in this case, it wasn't the best application of the product. So we had some conversations to move to Power BI. So this is kind of an example. I just want to give a, a quick snapshot um, at a couple of the reports that they're actively using today. We'll get more into them a little bit later uh, and talk about how they're transforming the way that they're using data now purposefully as a tool to drive their business. Um, so here's just a quick sample of a, a handful of the reports that we transitioned from Excel over to Power BI to give the, put the control in the user's hands. So I'll take a quick second and just introduce myself. Uh, so uh, my name is Mike Casey, happily married, 13 years. Uh, somehow I got her to, she's, she's stuck, stuck with me so far. My biggest champion and, and, and partner, uh, father of two amazing little girls, um, 10 and seven. Uh, it's a journey. Um, I live in Michigan now uh, by way of Florida for about four years and Ohio, uh, born and raised in Cincinnati. Um, I've spent a little over 18 years in healthcare IT, uh, working multiple different roles from, you know, the help desk guy, the field tech, doing engineer, lead engineer, all the way up to my most recent uh, position, which was the chief technology officer at a healthcare practice. Um, you know, deeply experienced in, you know, technical and business focused roles. So I kind of always sat somewhere in between the two worlds. I'm not full techie, I'm not full business, just kind of that in-between guy. Um, I, another big piece about me is I, I love a lot of things. <laughs> I could, uh, you know, love technology, outdoors, sports, uh, camping, fishing, hiking. Uh, you know, I, I mentioned in here specifically, you know, I find my center outdoors, um, and, and you know, just sitting around a campfire, looking at the, looking at the the light, and it's just there's something different about it. it really helps you kind of connect with yourself, connect with nature, and really find who you are. Uh, so this year, as the next one kind of says there, I stepped out and started my own, uh, my own consultant company, uh, Purpose Guided Solutions. Uh, it's been an amazing uh, kind of jump. Uh, Donald, that's that's a good eye. We're, we're close to Frankenmuth there. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, I'm very passionate about what drives me and what really drove me to, to starting Purpose Guided Solutions. I'll get into a little bit more, but it, it's certainly surrounded by my family. Um, and, you know, getting to, you know, start taking practical steps to that life of freedom. Uh, just passionate about helping people and organizations uh, maximizing their potential. So taking something super complicated, making it something accessible so that people have the opportunity to succeed. So I have all this experience in healthcare, built my entire career around it, and I'm here talking to you about alcohol beverage. That makes sense, right? Um, I want to give you just a quick a quick uh, heading here. So I host, I host a, a bourbon night. We started it here when we're, we moved out here to Michigan. Uh, I've got a very small neighborhood of consists of about 10 to 12 houses. Uh, you know, so I started just inviting guys over and once a month uh, during the fall and spring, we kind of get together, hang out, just cigars, bourbons. We get to uh, taste different bourbon, uh, you know, the good ones, the bad ones, the expensive ones. Um, and I would say just like business intelligence solutions uh, and consultants for that matter, uh, most of the expensive ones aren't always the best. Uh, they're just, you know, sometimes the $12 bottle is much better than the, the $200 bottle. Uh, and, you know, so as we're doing this, I want to just kind of tee up a story. And this is a true story, which is how everything kind of started falling into place. So I moved up to Michigan, took this new position. and started seeing kind of some of the things that were going on, just wasn't aligned with it. Um, so I kind of want to set the tone by describing bourbon night. And, you know, we're in that setting, you know, and it's, you know, cool fall night, campfires roaring, uh, everyone's having cigars and conversations. And then all of a sudden, something completely unexpected happened. Um, a data analytics conversation broke out because, you know, that's normal, right? Like, bourbon, cigars, guys sitting around a fire, well, let's talk data. <laughs> um, so it was, you know, generally just engaging with a friend, having a conversation with him. He's the Excel guru now that I was referencing earlier. And he started talking and 
I was like, hey, man, there's this really cool tool that I've been using in healthcare practices, uh, helping to you know, shape some of the revenue cycle management and things like that. It's like, it, it's just, it's going to change. It's going to make things so much easier for you. Why don't you give it a try? So that continued. I told him that. I mentioned it to him every time I saw him for about five or six weeks um, until finally I kind of saw the things where I knew I needed to change. Um, and I had no idea how, how much this night would, would really change my entire trajectory. Um, you know, it started with just a general natural conversation, trying to offer some help to somebody, um, turned into me asking, Hey, why don't you let me try a proof, get, do a proof of concept for your company? Um, so let's just, let me show you how much this can help you. Uh, and then that eventually has turned into project and contract, contract work. Uh, it's just, it's been really a, a cool ride to be on. You know, I thought I moved here to Michigan for my dream job. Um, you know, using all my experience in the field I'd been focused on, I felt, you know, I finally made it. Um, you know, I was, I was a CTO at 35. It was like, what else do you want? Uh, and, you know, it turns out that, uh, that God had different plans for me. So on this next one, this is, this is the proof of concept that we built just at, at the beginning. I knew nothing about the industry, nothing about the data. We were just trying to pull it together and say, hey, what's, what's possible? Um, and I'll be honest, I spent way too many hours on this proof of concept. Uh, I know Avi's mentioned a couple of times and even the, the bonus project after is choose the right project to start. Um, I, I did not, I did not. This is a very complex project. <laughs> there were a lot of different things, high focus on Excel, like basically all the things on the not list it, the, the, they were in this. Um, you know, it was all free doing a proof of concept. Uh, I was just trying to pave a new path for me and my family. Uh, you know, I was doing all these work after hours uh, in an already extremely demanding job. Uh, for those of you who have worked in healthcare at all, uh, you know that doctors don't do their business during the day. Uh, they do their business on evenings and weekends and all the all the places that it's not super convenient for pretty much anybody else. Uh, you know, my family was incredibly supportive of me during this, uh, understood kind of the, the why I was doing it. They didn't really understand that they were the reason why, um, you know, working towards that life of freedom and the change. You know, at this point, I had just also started Avi's Learn Power BI program. So I was, you know, I had been using Power BI for a couple of years, for about four or five years. But I, it was just more one-off. Hey, I ran into this problem. Let me look up this video and figure out how to do this one thing. Um, and, you know, I ran into an issue on the proof of concept and I threw something out on the Facebook group and uh, Raul Jimenez, who's going to be talking, I believe tomorrow, um, he jumped in and I, I've got to say, I was just absolutely floored by his willingness to just jump in and help. Absolutely no strings attached. Um, it was funny. I was, I hopped on a video call with him and we were actively working on something for about two hours uh, I came out and told my wife what just happened. And like, man, this community is really great. And she's like, are you sure this isn't a scam? Like you just shared this information with this guy. I said, like, yeah, he genuinely just wanted to help. Um, so, you know, later I've continued on and joined the pro plus community and had a ton of support and help from a lot of members in the community. Uh, and, you know, Avi and the team, uh, just a really fantastic group, but I just want to jump back to the, um, I want to jump back to the, the, the story here at hand. So we did the proof of concept. It was well-received. So what do I do next? Um, you know, with the, the proof of concept was kind of my sales process, if you will, in this case. Um, so I had to go back and kind of look at things in a little more detail. So we're stepping all the way back. Before any technical work is even a thought, uh, you know, we had to first understand more specifically what challenges are we having in other words, what am I going to do to help the company? Um, you know, we found some of the main focuses that they really needed some help with were, you know, eliminating inefficiencies, um, you know, the ability to centrally access certain reporting, giving users and the executive team uh, access to be able to manipulate the ports themselves. Um, you know, they, they need things to be more dynamic and respond to the business questions that they have right now. Uh, and they just didn't have that access with, with the the current the former version of the Excel reports, so really putting the control in their hands. You know, after that, we needed to actually review the current systems and reports. 
I had been given just a handful of of uh, of Excel files that he gave me as a sample for the proof of concept and kind of figured things out mostly on my own. Um, and then we really jumped in. Uh, once we understood that, we kind of had to understand what's our plan of attack. Um, you know, how are we going to be going about this? What systems we're going to focus focus on? Uh, you know, this is, you know, we need to know what and how, but this is also not mentioned, not to mention going to give me some idea of a framework that I can scope my project around uh, so that I could actually provide them a proposal with, hey, this is what I'm going to do. Uh, so we agreed that, you know, we were going to target their, their three biggest things right out of the gate, um, VIP, Nielsen data, and their forecasting from spreadsheets. Uh, so, you know, we built the, the scope of work. Um, the, the big push there was speed to market. We wanted to, like, we wanted to transition from the proof of concept to getting something good in their hands quickly. Um, and so that was uh, the, really the, the driving focus. Um, now we have the scope and we have the project kicked off and there had to be a lot of work to understand, you know, where does the data exist? Uh, how are we going to connect to it? Uh, you know, how are we going to take all these flat files and turn them into a data model? Uh, and, you know, we're going through and as we're doing that, we found some pretty glaring holes in the data because I have the only client in, in the world that had messy data. Um, I say jokingly because there's every, every data is messy. Uh, you're never going to find the perfect one. So if you think you're alone, you're not. Um, you know, we jumped in, found VIP, had had columns where they were supposed to be um, unique columns, and they weren't. Um, we found after we're building. Uh, forecasting wasn't the same level. They were looking at state information, but they couldn't go any further than that. And I had channel information, which is another step down. So it was just kind of tricky trying to put all those pieces together. Um, and then Nielsen as well. Hey, you know, they're, they re they report things out on a weekly basis for the entire week. Uh, so every Saturday, we just get an end of week date. We don't have the, the daily date. And the company is using um, a standard calendar. Um, so fast forwarding a little bit um, as we're cruising through here, um, now it was time to make it real. We spent a little bit that, you know, of that data model, data model, data model, which is I can't emphasize enough. Uh, if you've ever seen a large building being built, they spend three quarters of the time on the foundation. And there's there's intentionality behind that. I suggest you do the same as you approach Power BI. Um, but we started presenting our first reports. Um, so we we did it iteratively. We started off with our, you know, our executive team. Uh, then we had those conversations, took their feedback, and then the directors. Um, and then we moved on to the team members once everything was kind of solidified. Uh, so, you know, we really spent a lot of time working through those and trying to do it quickly, but in, in you know, in a way that was accessible. So I'm going to really oversimplify some of those challenges here. You know, these were some of the things that we found as we were going. Uh, you know, we had inconsistencies with the columns, like I was stating. Uh, it should have been key columns that we could use if you're not familiar with that. You just, that's our, our, one, our one side of the one to many. Um, and there was just, there was nothing there uh, that was unique. We kept getting a bunch of errors because there were duplicates. Um, and it just, it, it was causing a lot of chaos. Uh, you know, we were trying to build our dimension tables like the product table and account table and so on. Um, this presented a huge, a huge obstacle. Um, and then again, the calendar. Um, I come from the healthcare world who typically doesn't operate off of that same fiscal calendar unless you're in the larger health systems. Um, so they currently, the current client was using a standard calendar for all of their operations. Uh, however, like I was stating, the Nielsen data is coming in once a week. Um, so we had to really kind of focus and stretch and think about Right. How are we going to address this the right way to make it effectively used? Um, and then much later in the process, this this may not be you know necessarily overly technical and in, in its value, but you know most of the users were used to pulling in spreadsheets, being handed okay, this is the couple pieces that you need to look at, or you need to piece together your information from a report. Um, and much later in the process, this we came across this data visualization challenge. Never thought that this was going to be a, a challenge. 
Uh, so we started putting things in different graphs and bar charts and, you know, all the fun things. And they, they just never worked with it before. Uh, so they didn't know how to how to operate with it and function with it. And I mean, I can tell you anything is if you take something away is it doesn't matter if it's pretty if they can't use it. Um, you know, you know, you have the prettiest piece of garbage at the top of the garbage can or you can have that chewed up pencil that's in your hand every day. Um, you know, it just it doesn't work unless they can really use it. Uh, so we started presenting with some of them. They were struggling with it. Uh, so we had to kind of think through how are we going to to change our approach to really go to that next that next level with them. So solving, you know, what do we do to solve some of these challenges? Uh, where did we go with it? Uh, you know, so our first one was that that you know non unique identifiers leveraged Power Query and created some of the custom key columns. Uh, you know, they just, it's easy to do. There's lots of different ways to approach it. It made it very approachable in Power BI. Would have been if there, this was replacing multiple lines of different VLOOKUPs and things like that that he was doing in his system to try to manually do this and curate it. And then he'd run his new report and be stuck again. Um, so we built some custom keys in Power Query that allowed us to separate it and start working towards that star schema uh, to really make it usable and functional. Uh, for the Nielsen, uh, the Nielsen concern or challenge, we had no choice. Like we really needed to go to that weekly context for this specific model. Uh, so we ended up splitting the models where we have a Nielsen model and we have a VIP and forecasting model um, because we really wanted to leverage this very specific um, uh, issue. So we put in a custom 445 calendar, uh, gave us kind of some of the weekly context uh, that's very traditional in the in the retail space, and especially the alcohol dev space. Um, and then for the the visualizations, we we started looking at okay, you know what, Mike, put a, put aside your pride, let's let's start uh, incorporating some more matrix. <laughs> Everything doesn't have to be a visual. Uh, it, it's you know it's quick, it's easy, but necessarily it doesn't always tell the whole story. So we started blending a little bit more matrix visuals. There's some report pages that are completely. Um, completely matrix or tables. Um, and that's totally fine. Uh, you know, it's it's about what the end user is doing with the data, not how I perceive the, the glamor of my report. Um, so with that, I'm gonna kind of just jump in. I'll, I'm gonna walk through just a couple of the reports. Um, I'll try to go, I have, I have a handful that I wanna go through and I've got some notes on it. Um, I do wanna check real quick here as I pull this up. Um, uh, Avi, are you are you guys able to see the? Yeah. Um, the, yeah see the no problem with that. Now. Perfect. Just want to make sure that that came up. Okay. So this is our our VIP model. Um, so this is again this is focused on our on more of the uh, depletion side of things. So distribution tracking. Uh, you know, we started with the focus on you know how we're doing versus our forecast. So this is our quick our monthly view. This is intended just to give a quick snapshot of, you know, what did we forecast? How have we done month to date? Uh, this percent in is just the progress towards forecast um, based on where we're at in the month. Um, and then we show some last year metrics. Uh, and again, depletions, that's what's actually been, been pulled from inventory. And then we've also got the shipments uh, that shows like what's actually been sent out some quick trackers for their, their leadership team to keep an eye on things. You know, red is bad, green is good. Um, shows where they're at and towards the progress in their in their um, forecast. We broke it out by our focus markets and secondary markets. Uh, so they had some, they have some states that are, this is key, this is where we're putting a lot of, uh, uh, this is where we're putting a lot of effort and time into. Uh, so we've split those out so they can quickly kind of see how are they doing in those states versus the others. Um, and then again, we have different levels of data where it goes from down to chains and the clubs um, and then independent. So we're kind of breaking out what the retail um, looks like. Um, and then we broke everything out by state. Uh, so that was one of the challenges. And I, I'll walk through that in just a moment. Um, but we we wanted to layer in our forecasting data, which again doesn't go down to the same level as all of our VIP data. So we had to figure out what visuals made sense on what pages so that data could interact with each other. Um, you know, as we're going through here, we you know we're able to quickly slice everything down by 
by individual state, um, I'll choose one that might actually have some sales. Sorry, Alaska, you probably do not. Um, so we can flip through some of these different ones. And it just filters everything to context of what's going on in that state. You can see how the different chains are performing in that state, it gives you some quick visual indicators of what's actually happening. Um, as we're moving on, I basically, that brought up the question, okay, so we know how we're performing on a monthly basis. So this is essentially the same, but year to date, um, where it just shows over time so far this year, here's how we're performing, here's where we're going. The top here is this is all the individual client data. So we're really focused in on them, how they're performing. Um, one that was developed a little bit later, um, it doesn't have the, uh, the, the sexy flair, if you will. I mentioned it doesn't have to be visual to be important here, is this unsold accounts. This one was has been hugely impactful on, their, on the organization. Um, we identify this account sold status. So this indicates if an account has had a sale in the past 18 months, but hasn't purchased in the last 90 days. So we can say, yes, they're an active client because they had a sale, but no, they're not there. They haven't purchased anything recently. This is really helping drive their sales team to, hey, why aren't they purchasing? So this is kind of more of an overall view of what they've got, what their different accounts that they're selling to. Again, it's all dummy data um, uh, that's on here. But we can see, hey, this, this account has had a sale in the last 18 months, but they haven't bought anything in the last six months. What's going on there? Um, we gave them the ability to actually just also for building this with the intent of our sales team in mind, where they can drill through and look at their details by address. And this takes them specifically to that account. They can see what products were purchased, when they were purchased. Um, so they can say, okay, hey, you know what? You haven't bought anything since February. I noticed last time that you bought you know, product one and product two, how are you doing on that inventory? Um, hey, we just have this new product. I noticed you haven't purchased product 12 before. Would you like to try to give it a, give it a try? Um, but it also gives them context. So, you know, geographically we added in, you know, where they're at, we included their addresses so they could actually build sales routes around what they're looking at. Um, again, kind of moving in that same direction is that the address details which is the same thing, but this is designed more specifically for the folks, the sales folks to really engage. This actually works really well on mobile, despite having um, a handful of the different sliders. But if I'm a sales rep, I can come in and just select myself out of this group and see, I think I did I choose one in Florida. Yes, okay, perfect. Um, again, fake name. So I was trying to tie it in, make sure I chose the right fake name. Uh, but so these are all the sales associated with this sales rep. Um, and this is, you can kind of see his territory is down this um, and down out into the keys. Um, but then I can also, at the same time, I can see what addresses are there, when their last purchase date was. Um, as you zoom in, it'll filter out the data. So if I'm trying to build my sales route and know where I'm, where I'm meeting with folks, I can zoom all the way in and say, hey, I'm going to be up in the Port St. Lucie area this afternoon. What accounts could I hit? And then which ones haven't purchased? Um, so that's been fantastic. Uh, they've been using this a lot, again, using the products to go through. Um, just briefly touch on a couple more that are in this in this VIP model. Again, this is this is more for the, the leads to, and this, uh, more the sales directors to really assess how individual chains are performing. So you can see I've got this one filtered to the ABC fine line. Um, and that tells us how, you know, how we're performing from that client year over year, current year. This is our forecast for that chain and our, our plan for the chain. So being able to kind of make those quick comparisons, again, it's about accessible data that's going to make an impact for the team. Um, just briefly touching on these ones, again, this is focused on getting the most juice from the squeeze, right? If I'm going to spend the time going through this, I want to get to the meaningful insights as quickly as possible. And that's where we kind of started working on this 150 counts um, page. Uh, and then looking more down towards like the individual state performances uh, where we can compare how they're doing, how each product is doing by the different products or I'm sorry, by the different states that they're doing. And then we break them down by chain accounts versus independent accounts. Uh, you can slice it by on off premise. So just a lot of different ways that you can interact with it to get to the information you need. 
so that that's the direction we kind of took with with VIP. Um, I do want to briefly show. I mentioned earlier uh, some of the challenges we had with the different levels of aggregation. So I kind of I put a couple of these together. So this was um, our initial model. We started with I talked about the speed to market option. We focused on just bringing in VIP first. So we put it in there. Um, this is our, our basic kind of star schema that we got from uh, driven from Excel. Like guys, these, these are these are driven from Excel reports. This is not a huge complicated uh, configuration that we have going. Um, so it started here and then we said, okay, now we wanna bring in forecasting. Let's, let's get into the forecasting piece. So then just focus on the forecasting. They had a lot of different forecast files because they, they do plans, they do shipments um, uh, for, for both the state and the monthly levels. Uh, so we want, we needed to tie that all together, but we needed to also make it interactive with our VIP information. Because what good is it if we know what our forecast is, we can't compare it to what our actuals are. So that's where we started pulling all that together. And we ended up with multiple fact tables, but we're still following the same basic methodology of the one to many's all across the board. Um, we're tying together the state and the product levels, but we just have to be cognizant of what can interact. I can't go down to the retail account level in my forecasting. Um, so that, that's where we ended up with our with our VIP so far. Um, I just wanna briefly kind of touch a couple that we had in our Nielsen model. Um, so they don't have the, the full on Nielsen um, aspect where they're pulling in, uh, you have options that can cost you three quarters of a million dollars a year or different where you get direct access to all the data. Um, I think one of the, somebody posted on one of the earlier chats that, hey, you know, Nielsen's expensive. They do have par down options based on your needs too. So if you have a specific niche you're focused on or a region, like they, they can do that. They can target those things down to you. Um, you know, there's not to say there's not some limitations with it, but, you know, it's it's functional. And, you know, we took that functional and started loading it in here and made it transformative. Um so we're, we're, we jumped into Nielsen, uh, again, you know, one of the biggest things we had to use the weekly basis for the model. So if anybody who's been in retail or used retail, you can see that, you know, we have the, what I think is a pretty common breakdown for, for retail and CPG, where it's the four week look back, the 13, 26 and 52 week. So we can quickly kind of slice through with Nielsen, um, just to kind of tee up a couple other things before I go through. Um, one, the VIP information was focused solely on us um, as um, uh, as a company. Uh, so it's our data, it's just sales and things related to us. When we flip over to Nielsen, now we're, okay, now this is everything. Um, and again, this is all dummy data. So none of it, none of it's real, except for some of the, the brand names that are out there. Um, so we flipped over and we start looking at, at Nielsen. And that's why you'll notice things like um, our brand at the top. This is focused on our brand. Um, obviously, this is not our actual brand. Um, Brewery Chicago would not be very uh, definable for, for a product. Uh, but we just focused in on our brand at the top so we could see where we compare versus others. Um, and we, at a very quick glance, see that. We can jump in and uh, just choose an arbitrary one here. We can jump in and it changes so I can see where we're at versus them over the same time period. Um, one of the tricky things I do want to touch on here is we talk about different levels. Uh, I don't want to get too overly technical with it, but the aggregating levels of data. Um, so we have things from Nielsen that start off at total total US. So that's everything. Um, and then we get a separate report that's state-focused data. And then we have another report that's channel-focused data, which gets us down to like the retail accounts, think like your store data. Um, the problem is they don't always, they don't aggregate up. So if I total all of my state sales, you would think that would equal my total US, but they don't. Um, because you don't, you, there's certain assumptions I think that are being made, that are get made in the Nielsen reporting data. And that is, um, uh, so they break things out a little bit differently. So when we were approaching this, we had to start figuring out, okay, how are we going to make this visually? So just getting me to be able to click on this, which is US information, um, so I'm clicking on this and we're just showing me all US data. I had the request, okay, well, when I click on Carbless or, or any of them, 
I want to see how they're doing on the state side. Like, what does that look like? Um, so this is totally different set of dimensions that are pulling from that state information uh, so that we can interact with one another. Um, and it's it's been very, uh, very helpful for the team. Um, again, we can break down because we're talking now more retail sales. They're going to get a little bit more specific and granular than we were on the distributions. Uh, so we can break it out. The current company is a seltzer company. So they're highly focused on seltzers. Um, but we could, you know, pop that out. And now you're seeing everything in the ready to drink portion that they're pulling down from their data. Uh, I'm going to keep this focus in just to keep it a little bit smaller data. The base alcohol is another one. So a tequila seltzer versus a vodka seltzer. How do we compare against our peers within that market? So if we just filter down to that, again, we get another smaller subset of lists. Um, although I chose seltzer and vodka and I don't have anything in there for that month. Um, and then pack size was another, that this was one that we added later that was hugely helpful to them because they were, they had multiple different, they had loose, you know, the individual ones think, you know, buying a drink at a bar. Um, they had four packs, eight packs, the bigger 12 packs, but what's working? Um, and they were in this state of transition where they're trying to figure out which one are we looking to focus on next? Um, and they've been shifting to, you know, moving to eight packs versus four packs. Um, and I have got some different metrics that we put together after the fact, but um, the big the big thing here is building that model out and getting things to to be able to play off of one another was very, very helpful and giving them the ability to now slice and look at this information without running multiple reports. Um, just briefly, this is again, that same concept except at the state focus level. Uh, so we can drive into our different our different states and see how they're performing. Um, so if we have a marketing campaign or a BOGO offer we're going to put in the state of Florida, we can check and see, okay, we have this running through you know June and July. Did we see an increase in sales as a result um, and versus you know how are we doing last year? Uh, so we can, you can really kind of start measuring those metrics. Again, you're able to kind of look at all the individual ones here um, and see who's performing, how did this group compare to us and vice versa. Um, again, all, all the while keeping our focus on ourselves at the top and how we compare to them. Um, and then again, I talked about the, the aggregating levels of data. And this one is going now from state to channel. So I can then see of all my sales in, um, in Florida, most of them were liquor store FMCG. And then I've got convenience stores, liquor stores. Um, so it kind of breaks everything out so they can see a little bit better what's going on. Um, state comparisons again this is that big focus on pack size and how they're performing um, individually um, I think I've got a lot of data in here on this one we just added something to it um, but again being able to break everything down the same way um, I do want to touch on this so we were evaluating talking about using this for for purposeful decision making and growth they're evaluating new product launches uh, so this is now, instead of the ready-to-drink category and seltzers, this is now looking at, at uh, tequila, uh, liquor uh, sales. So we can break this one down now by the bottle size and how, you know, what price point do we want to try to get into? Um, what bottle sizes are we looking at? Uh, we can look at the different price buckets to see, okay, these, these are how the $30 to $34 bottles are operating versus, you know, our higher end $120, and, uh, 120 to $150. Uh, and you can see 120, 150, if you think the alcohol industry is, not, is recession proof, there's some data that says otherwise. Um, people are going more towards the, the lower mid tier uh, for their products. Um, here we kind of shift into the client focus. Uh, so how are we performing as, uh, as a company? What are, our, what are our flavors? What products are selling the best? Uh, really designing what that strategy can look like. Uh, hey, I've had you know minimal sales consistently, and this one looks like. And again, this is not my client, so uh, it's a little. So this is their variety pack. So you can see in May, most of their sales, and every month is their their large variety pack. And again, you can kind of see it here as well. Uh, the breakdown of how they've sold and performed over months, and it's funny you can kind of see the tropical flavors picking up in the. In the June, July, August timeframe, 
and then you see the different holiday packs. It's just, it's interesting to see and, and informative to them to see how they're performing um, both at a macro level, but now honing in on that micro level. Um, just an expanded view of that, of that state category. Um, nothing extraordinarily different here other than just a little bit of a different breakdown to how they're performing by the different channels. Um, and then again, we were at, we were. This was one that's not really accessed very frequently, but it was more about hey, we're really trying to evaluate this pack size thing. How how does that work? So we started breaking everything out by pack size. So you can see we talked about how they're going to be focusing on you know that that eight pack, and you can see eight packs been outperforming over last year every month this year, whereas your six packs and twelve packs have been going the opposite direction. Um, so it's been just very helpful for them to kind of break those down and see uh, see where those different things go. The model here, I didn't have a chance to like really clean this one up um, uh, like I did with the VIP to create some custom views for you guys. But again, it's a fairly simple setup. Um, when we start talking about our just, just very simple star schema, we've got our fact table. And our different dimensions all just tying back in um, with our one to many connections. Um, very simple, but very complicated at the same time. Uh, most of that was, you know, we talk about a good model and, and using some of the unique factors with the four, four, five, and things like that made, like Matthias was talking about earlier, made some of our DACs more complicated uh, because we didn't, we had some complications in our model. We've been able to work through them, but it was, it was somewhat challenging as we get through that. So I'm going to shift back here. Flip back to my PowerPoint. So this was after we published our Nielsen model. Uh, this is a quote from their their COO, um, where like you just you just start seeing the transformation of this of this you know how they're using the data and what they're doing with it. Um, and no, that's not the actual CRO. That's just, just he's just a stock image. Maybe he is a CRO. I don't know. Uh, he looks very professional and think God, I, I don't know. We'll see. Um, but, uh, you know, th this was just huge to see an organization who was starving for access to the data finally start getting it and start going to be able to put the pieces together and put it into, put it into play at work, um, which is just, it's awesome to see. And, and quite honestly, everyone on this call either has or will hit that that milestone. And it's it's a, it's a fantastic feeling. Like it's, it's just very fulfilling and rewarding to be able to contribute to somebody else's success. Um, you know, just to kind of wrap things up, again, our, our things, none of this was extremely complicated. Our, our entire model is solely built off of Excel spreadsheets. Um, you know, they're dumped into a SharePoint folder and I pick them up from there. No data warehouses, no crazy power automate things, no data flows, premium subscriptions. Um, we're definitely looking at enhancing things as we move forward, uh, but we wanted to get it in their hands. And we don't, you know, there's that old quote, don't let perfect be the enemy of good. Um, you know, we didn't want to wait for perfect. And I would say <laughs> that has a lot more meaning, not only in this instance, but also my career. Like I could have easily said, I don't know what the heck I'm doing with retail and alcohol bev, I need to wait until I learn more. And I would have completely missed out on a lot of these opportunities. Um, you know, the next, the other thing that I would really want to touch on is understanding the problem. Um, you know, how, uh, how is what you're doing going to help the client? It can't just be about pulling the information in and spitting information out. Like there's a lot of, of the techie folks who that's what they do. Is you pull it in, you spit out, you said you wanted a number, here's a number. Okay, but but why do you, instead of, you know, pop coming to that same situation saying, hey, why are you trying to get to that number? What is that going to help you do? And how can I maybe piece some other things you're not thinking about along with that to form a full picture instead of, hey, sales are up by 20% compared to what? There's like the different levels of, of questions. There's some funny memes surrounded by that, but um you know, we started out our actual project understanding what the problems were we needed to solve, the heartaches, the obstacles, uh, and how we can leverage our tool to empower them and not a chore that they had to get through in order to be able to do their job. 
um, you know, the lots of time preparing the data instead of using it. Um, and then, you know, like I said, you don't have to be stuck where you are right now. Just take an intentional step. You know, I started in healthcare. Um, Avi can surely attest to this. We had a lot of conversations and him dragging me through the mud, um, but I struggled moving on from it. Uh, you know, there were, I was fighting to stay in the industry that I knew. Uh, and, you know, honestly, if I'm being honest, a lot of it was driven by fear, uh, fear of the unknown, fear of being uncomfortable. Um, you know, I spent my entire career in healthcare, my contacts, my business relationships, all healthcare focused. What was I doing? And, you know, the reality is I had to step out into an uncomfortable, take some uncomfortable steps in order to make this a reality. Um, you know, I, I always say this to my kids and my friends, and there's no growth in comfort. Uh, you talk about across the board, like you talk about, you know, eating healthy. Guess what? If you've been eating unhealthy for a long time, there's going to be a transition. Working out, you don't grow muscle mass by staying at one level forever. Um, and the same thing is, is come, you know, we've learned some of the lessons the hard way with, my, with life. You have to take some uncomfortable steps to find the greater things out there. Uh, you know, from moving my family cross country multiple times over the past seven years uh, to asking to do the first proof of concept. Uh, I mean, even speaking here today, these are all very uncomfortable steps for me. Uh, this is not something I do. <laughs> so very uncomfortable steps, but can be very rewarding. I got to meet and interact with a lot of the folks around the program and through this process. It's been absolutely fantastic. Um, you know, none of it was easy from an emotional perspective. But when you really stop and look back at it, man, these should have been some of the easiest decisions of my life. Um, but I was just too busy holding myself back. Uh, I just, I, you know, kept pushing and kept wanting to stay on the things. So, um, by the way, that's not actually their CEO and COO. Just in case everybody was wondering, but thought it was fun anyway. <laughs> Excuse me. So thank you so much for your attention today. Uh, before I do wrap up, though, I, I really want to make sure uh, to call out like the community involvement here. Uh, I work with Kim Noko all the time, who you heard speak earlier. Uh, Greg Baird, who's not on, not, who wasn't uh, presenting this time around. Uh, and Raul, uh, just tremendously helpful, not only with the presentation stuff, but with the projects. Um, you know, just the team effort and, and having somewhere to go. And I know I'm missing lots of other folks on here, so please don't be offended. But, um, you know, the community has been absolutely you know, tremendous. Um, and I was, if there's anything that I can do to help you or your organization, please don't hesitate um, to connect with me. I've got my LinkedIn information, um, email address, uh, happy to, you know, help in any possible way.